In this discussion, I'd like to discuss a theoretical concept which is contained within the classical teachings of Xing Yichuan. Um, the classical teachings of Xing Yichuan include a corpus of written texts, oral uh, verses um, that have been collected into a written text over subsequent generations that include, for the most part, key principles and instructions to the practice of the art. Um, these include uh, concepts related to basic requirements to structure, all the way up to instructions on uh, key aspects of the elements themselves. You will find more recent, more subsequent, when I say recent, I'd say in the last 100 to 150 years, uh, texts that extrapolate on teachings with regards to the elements, the animals, and even down to generalized concepts such as fighting principles, um, mentality, and uh, there are even some branches that include esoteric texts that uh, delve into more of the uh, somewhat esoterical side, somewhat medical side uh, of the arts. However, there are some texts that are considered uh, Xing Yichuan, within Xing Yichuan canon or uh, core texts or Quanpu. Uh, the Chinese term for these classical texts are called Quanpu. Uh, these are, um, it's, a, it's a term that is referring to other styles as well, whatever corpus of classical texts or instructions and teachings they have, they, the, the Chinese term is Quanpu. There are some in Xing Yichuan that are considered um, corpus or core that are um, shared amongst the differing lineages because over time you would find that uh, differing lineages would uh, develop their own teachings or even branch off of certain parts of the teaching and add to it. And this actually is what happened. This is the nature of these classical teachings that each subsequent generation would uh, add to them. However, there's a few key points that people should keep in mind with regards to these trenpu and how they uh, originated and what their purpose was from the initiating periods up until today. Uh, because contrary to popular belief, they weren't something that were compiled uh, in a sense for general propagation, prop uh, you know, to be uh, promulgated throughout the general community. Um, they weren't something that was going to be published and mass distributed. In fact, a lot of these teachings were handed down orally up until a point that they were written. Um, in some cases, many of the practitioners of older generations and even some of the more recent, like I said, last 100 to 150 years generations were illiterate people. So you find that a lot of these uh, classical texts are uh, in rhyming fashion. They, they, they exist as poems that somewhat rhyme or have a beat or a tempo to the way the words come out. Um, to make them easy to remember, and this gives you some, some insight into how they were developed and why. Two reasons why such a thing would occur is one, uh, in order to better remember it, it's better if it rhymes and, and things like that. You, you should know like uh, uh, nursery school rhymes growing up, we remember them as kids even when we couldn't read or write simply because they were either in rhyme or song fashion to a degree. The other it also is uh, because of the inability to write, um, it's an easier way to remember as well. So a lot of these texts were handed down um, and the way that they were um, originally, they originally came out was in, in oral format, and then they became, they became written. So, the core Xing Yichuan texts um, over the subsequent generations have been somewhat refined and organized. We see this because uh, what we consider one of the oldest texts, which is uh, the Xin Yi Quanpu, or the Xin Yi Liu He Quanpu, uh, which has got a different character for Xin, it's got the heart character. Um, we see this because in that text there were in certain sections a lot of differing ideas that were kept in one section and just repeated one after the other. And we find that a lot of those things were then further separated and then organized into a, syst a systematic kind of structure uh, through subsequent generations. The oldest texts that I just mentioned are attributed or coming out of into the public light, uh, most popularly the Dai family. Now the Dai family did Dai family Xin Yi Quan, um, and the text in question that became more widely uh, known and seen is purportedly penned by Dai Long Bang, Dai Long Bang who then uh, in his uh, introduction of course attributed to, to previous people. Uh, we're not too sure about those claims however. So. Uh, we know that the, at least we know that the Dai family had these texts. Now, why is this important to Xing Yi Quan? Well, Xing Yi Quan comes from Li Luoneng, and Li Luoneng 
who compiled this, the system that we practice, Xing, uh, with a G. Um, he studied with the Dai family. And, um, and of course, this is obviously where he had uh, exposure not only to whatever corpus they were uh, uh, teaching in terms of content, but uh, uh, in terms of the theoretical texts, he must have had access to them as well. So there's the connection between this mother style and descendant style. Uh, so there's an ancestor-descendant relationship directly between Xin Yi Quan and what we do today in Xin Yi Quan. The Dai family still practices their art today. Um, it is uh, in many aspects very different to Xin Yi Quan. However, as we know, uh, you are quite different from your ancestors as well but there is still a genetic link. And the genetic link here are the basic principles and the basic teachings of the style. So the, the core concepts that were within these uh, original Xinyi Quanpu were so important to the style uh, that they were carried forward and as I said, further organized and systemized um, into specific uh, topics that were organized in just a little bit more of a coherent manner than they exist in the, in the older older texts. And we see this from Li Luoneng himself in what is purported to have been his compilation of a, dry, a, a diary. Um, that he took some of those ideas and then just further organized them into a more, you know, um, organized manner. And some of them he expanded on. But this is the point of these Chuanpu. The point of these Chuanpu and these instructions is that these are instructions between a teacher and his student. And this is the second part that I think a lot of Westerners have a tough time understanding. One, they weren't published for public dissemination. They were usually instructions between a teacher and their student for the pur purposes of their learning. And uh, they didn't come alone. It wasn't as if they were given these instructions or these texts without the teaching uh, coming through the teacher as well. It was, a, it was a matter of an entire method of learning that included the practice, the explanation from the teacher, as well as the theoretical uh, whatever instructions or older texts that were included with it, with the explanation. So looking at a text like this without your teacher explaining it to you, uh, for the most part, could be misinterpreted. And uh, again, this now comes back to the gene uh, genealogy of styles. So it's very important that there is a link to between yourself and the uh, founder of a style to understand there's a continuation of knowledge. Otherwise, the knowledge between these uh, generations without the explanation of a teacher, even with the written texts, can be misunderstood, can be um, incorrect, can be carried forward with the wrong ideas and intentions. So it's very important that we understand that these classical texts have an ancestor to descendant relationship uh, with the current theoretical corpus, but it's a living descendancy. It's not a dead descendancy that today's practitioners are going to look back and uh, have uh, uh, some complete misunderstanding because theoretically, if they're legitimate lineage practitioners, they would have learned the corpus of the theories and the content from their teacher, who would have learned it from their teacher, who would have carried on all the way back. So there's a continuation of this knowledge. It shouldn't be speculation what these uh, um, messages and uh, theoretical content is within the style's corpus of classics. So um, this is a couple of things that people should keep in mind when they're understanding this. In my particular case, I learned Xing Yi Quan with my teacher, Di Guo Yong. Um, Di Guo Yong is an older generation practitioner, uh, and his teacher in Xing Yi Quan was Zhao Zhong. Um, my my, my shifu, Di Guo Yong, his Bagua teacher was Li Ziming, who was also born in the Qing dynasty. My teacher himself is an older generation who not only studied with people that were classically trained, but also my teacher learned classical writing, of course, from his generation. And the, another important point, and this is not supposed to be a history lesson on my teacher, but another important point is that my teacher um, is the youngest of uh, his uh, siblings, um, approximately six siblings, and there was an age difference of approximately 20-something years between him and his oldest brother. Um, his parents were quite an advanced age when, when he was born. Um, you know, the majority of his siblings have passed on from old age, because my teacher himself is old, but my teacher's father himself was also born at the end of the Qing dynasty. So uh, the classical household that he grew up in uh, aided him in terms of understanding that period of people. Uh, his teachers as well, being from that period, uh, it was a clear understanding on the way things were taught. It's not a modern issue. So that aside, my teacher himself, apart from his teachings that he got from his teachers and the texts, 
he's been obviously involved in the Xingyi community, um, which again, I don't want to get into here, for a number of decades. He's well known within this field and, uh, you know, he's one of the few people that I see rattling off these old canon, um, the classics, word for word, just out of memory. Um, he has a level of study and depth in these things that I have rarely seen, even with a lot of people in his generation, although it's more common with people in his generation, but subsequent generations not so much. So, you know, when he would teach me um, Xing Yichuan and Ba Gua Zhang specifically as well, in this case Xing Yichuan, it wasn't without the classical corpus of explanation and as well as the texts and the things that he would explain and the theoretical principles would be expounded upon and expa explained. So this is how things were taught to me. Now, um, moving on from that, today's discussion I wanted to talk a little bit about one particular uh, uh, so-called proverb but so-called instruction that is contained within the corpus of Xing Yichuan's instructions and that is Liang zhou bu li lei, liang shou bu li xin, chu dong ru dong jin sui shen. The translation, um, for the purposes of this video, just to give you an understanding, um, translates to the two elbows do not leave the flanks, the two hands do not leave the center line. They extend and retract tightly following the body to attack when the opponent is unprepared, striking the opponent by surprise. Now this translation that I've done here is the is a translation that I've done to best embody the message contained with its instruction. There are further parts to this uh, the, the section that uh, the first instance of this instruction exists, but we are going to focus on this instruction because it is contained in one basic uh, concept. This is one instruction. Um, the words I used um, are to give you the best explanation of the principles contained. And with a lot of these trend pool, an overarching idea is usually contained within numerous parts, well, numerous words or numerous small phrases grouped together to give you an, over, well, an overarching concept or idea. In this case, the concept is talking about the placement of the elbows and the hands in relation to your body, and then why this occurs, to what effect does it, uh, does it, uh, uh, create and the effect in this case is uh, the last latter part of the quote regarding striking the opponent uh, without being a, you know uh, without him being prepared etc so these are connected they are not separate issues it's not the first part of the quote means one thing that is disconnected from the second part they are connected to give you an overarching idea that uh, the orientation will enable you to do this and the orientation is how you should do this they are connected ideas so um, let, I'll break it down in in simpler terms uh, well sorry in more specific terms with regards to the text itself Liang Zhou Buli Lei. Now, the Liang, Liang Zhou means the two elbows, and Buli uh, is not, uh, do not leave or do not separate from. And the Lei in this case is the ribs or the rib cage, but in the terms of the understanding of this, uh, this proverb, it's talking about the flanks of the body. Uh, in general, this area here. Um, the second part talks about Liang Zhou, Buli Xin, and it's the two hands, and the words do not, se do not separate or do not, uh, do not leave the, uh, the, the, the word that they use is xin, which means heart. But in this sense, they're talking about center. In the Chinese language, xin usually means the center of something. In fact, in terms of Chinese, modern Chinese today, it still exists. And when you talk about uh, some uh, center, for example, a, uh, a location that deals with something like a training center or something, they'll use the word zhong xin. Jung meaning middle and Xin meaning heart, but together it gives you the idea that it's a center. And again, in English we have the same thing, the center. So um, a training center as well as the center of something are two concepts that are contained within English as well. So the idea is more important than the specific word. Um, and taking this on its own, these two instructions about the elbows and the hands gives you an understanding of a very important uh, part of Xing Yichuan's practice with regards to dropping the shoulder, sinking the elbows and drawing them in, or called bao. Bao means to wrap or draw inwards or to, to embrace. Um, so let's break it down a little bit. Again, it's something that is misunderstood, but uh, it's actually not too uh, complicated to understand. If we keep our elbows, as they said, close to our, 
two sides without taking into consideration the orientation of our hands. The plane of motion with regards to moving forward and backwards could be here. And this would be in line with the elbows staying um, on, the, on, the, you know, on the flanks, basically, when they're going in and out. However, the second part of the instruction talks about liang shou bu li xin, meaning the two hands are oriented or uh, pointing towards the center, kept on the center. And in this case, it's your center. So by understanding the two, the two elbows are on the sides of the body and the two hands are on the center, it gives you an idea of this triangulation and this pathway that you ideally want to move your arms and your limbs on, specifically your arms in this case, when they're moving, extending and retracting. Now, this is a very uh, simple point that we, we get into immediately when we start Santi Sure, when you understand the six harmonies, in this case the three external harmonies where they talk about the elbow and the knee, that this elbow is is uh, in harmony with the knee, but then also the alignment with the tip of the toe, the tip of the nose, and the tip of the fingers are kept uh, on a single plane. Um, you can understand that the elbow and knee harmony in a very superficial way, because it's a little bit deeper than this, is talking about orientation of drawing the elbow in. And the backhand has the same drawing in of the elbow on the side of the body. Now you can see there's already two parts of that retracting retracting and extended, extending that are contained simply within the static posture of Santi Shur. And these are contained within the one hand and the other hand. The one is extended, the other one is drawn in. Albeit lowered, but it's drawn in. So you can already see that when it's drawn in, it's close to the body. And when it's extended, it's still on that plane that has the elbow drawn in. And that's existing already in the static state of, uh, of Santi Shur as a principle. The key point here is that while you're thinking simply about the orientation of the two elbows and the two hands, this has an inherent energy, and that is the relationship between the two arms and the two elbows themselves. By saying that the hands and the elbows are on the flanks on the side of the body and the hands are on the center line, there is an energetic principle that is contained within the two elbows themselves, and that is that they're drawing in towards each other. In later Xing Yichuan classical text, there's a, a section called Ba Zi Jue. Now, Ba Zi Jue is the eight word poems, or the, um, yeah, it's basically called the eight words. And they are co a, con a collection of eight specific terms. And each term has a meaning, but it's explained with uh, usually a, a three, three things that must conform to this particular word. And one of the words is Bao. Bao means to wrap or embrace, contain. Um, and again, I'll quote directly from the classics with this. Liang zhou bao lei, chu ru bu luan. They're talking about your, your elbows or this part of your, your body. Um, and they say here that they bao or contain or embrace the ribs. This is again, the term bao has a much better uh, energetic understanding than just simply saying keep it uh, next to your ribs, you know, that's a placement issue. The, the term bao has this inward bracing, wrapping idea. So with this text here, it's already telling you that the two elbows have to wrap inwards. And uh, the second part of that instruction is saying why. And the reason is then you churu, your hands will extend and retract without being chaotic and messy. In other words, direct, neat, clear, and the most effective use of this trajectory when you're doing these techniques. Now you'll see that this applies as you've seen in the instructions for the five elements at their very basic level. Um, you see this there. I will get into some other aspects regarding how this, uh, the previous instruction appears in different Chuenpu and where it, it, uh, it appears and in which sections. Uh, and it's almost verbatim with this wording all the time. But uh, for the intents and purposes of here, we're going to talk about the energetic ideas in subsequent Chuenpu. We can see also in, in instructions on the five elements, for example, in Jin Yun Ting's manual, they talk, he talks about Zuan Quan, drilling fist, telling you that the little finger is turned up and the elbow is protecting the heart. So that already tells you that the elbow is in the middle of the chest. In other words, it's coming from here to here. It cannot be out here. In fact, the instruction with the little finger, it's not possible to turn the little finger upwards 
and keep the elbow outwards. It's going to be aligned up here. Now, the, the logic behind this, and this is coming back to the sun ball that I just spoke about, or the three wrappings and embracings, is, as I said, your, your techniques will not be messy. This is about structural alignment and alignment on a, on a plane of motion. There's another part of the Xingyi classics that are called the three uh, uh, sections, Sanjie, which is, a, again, it's a specific chapter on uh, a specific principle. Sanjie means the three, the three joints or the three sections. Now, this is a principle that's applied to the body as a whole. They break it down into three sections. And it's also applied to each limb on its own. It's a principle that can be applied on a part of the body or the whole body as a whole. And um, irrespective of how they break it down, the text does break it down and tell you how the arm is broken down. Each one of them talks about three sections and the three sections are the extremity or the tip, the middle section and the root. Um, so with regards to the arm, the way that they explain this is that the extremity is the fist and the elbow is the middle section and the shoulder is the root and the relationship between the three in terms of um, the three uh, in terms of uh, all all parts of the body whether it's the whole body or just a limb is the following the extremity initiates and we're talking about initiating movement or leads a movement the middle section follows and the root presses or urges forward and this principle is applied in this theory in this fashion to the body as a whole or each limb even to the legs and the, the the text goes on to talk about how the legs or the body as a whole is separated into these th three sections but the, the purposes of this discussion on the two elbows not leaving the flanks and the and the two hands not leaving the center um, we're going to talk about the arm and uh, the principle is connected to the principle of the elbows and the hands, etc. And the reason is very simple. If the instruction says that the hand initiates and the elbow follows, you can understand that they're trying to tell you to have the two traveling on as close to being on the same plane as possible, the same path. And this can make sense to you in terms of a um, trying to develop or generate power with your limb. From your core, this your body, to extend your hand out. If your fist is traveling on this path here, you'd want your elbow to get behind it as quickly as possible and aligned with it as quick as best as possible, traveling on that path. That is going to be the most efficient use and the most efficient and, and uh, correct way to, to, to execute that technique with your power being, being focused on one point. Um, so the key point about uh, that basic principle about the three sections is that in almost all cases when you're using your arm, whichever pathway your hand is traveling on, you want your elbow to be as close to directly on that path behind that limb or the end, in this case your fist or your palm, as quickly as possible while it's traveling on that path. Um, that means that you might say, well, at the end it's gotten there, but for the path, if your elbow has not been on that same traveling, on a parallel path here, then your force is not united and focused. So you want to get your elbow in and following behind that fist as soon as possible. Um, so this is very important and it's specifically applied to the, the five elements. We're talking about the most optimal orientation when you are practicing the five elements for these aspects. The five elements, much like Xin Yi Quan to Xin Yi Quan has an ancestor to descendant relationship, the five elements in Xin Yi Quan has an ancestor to descendant relationship on all the other techniques. The five elements are the core vectors of force and mechanics that are trained and practiced that then give birth to everything else. So they're a very crucial point of training, but th they must be understood as that is their core purpose. Their core purpose is to develop certain attributes. And in this case here, we're talking about structure, power, and vectors. Um, and you want to you want to have it as close to ideal and optimal as possible, particularly in training. I'd like to liken this analogy to when you go to a gym, and you have a you know you want to lift some weights. Sure, you could probably lift the weight on your own, and um, and you might get away with developing some muscle thing without your 
with your limited knowledge on the subject, you know, just going through the motions, etc. You might injure yourself as well over time, but that's a different story. But if you have a personal trainer who's an expert on the mechanics of how to do those particular exercises, he's going to tell you the optimal orientation to, for example, lift a weight for your biceps, it's more, you know, for your back, where your knees should be, where all your joints should be, how your, your, um, your movement must travel um, throughout the motion. He's going to tell you the optimal way to do it, to develop the most power, to develop the, the, the to get the greatest results through your training. Now, in the, in the environment of a gym, and a controlled environment, that's how you're going to train. And the strength that you're going to develop there through that correct training is going to be applied to everything you do in your life. And there's going to be situations when you want to pick something up or do something, you've got to catch something. You're not going to be able to optimally get perfectly into that uh, uh, perfect structural alignment like you were in the gym, but you're going to get pretty close. One, due to your habits. And two, you're also going to have the, the strength to be able to support it that you, because of your training being correct. Now, that's the same with the five elements. We try to get as close to perfect when we're doing the five elements with these alignments and structures as we can in the training, that when you're in a conflict situation, when you're fighting with something, when, when you have to apply a technique, it's going to come naturally as close, to as, as close as possible to that orientation that you've trained and ingrained for so long. We also know that even if you look at things like boxing or if you look at other Eastern martial arts, for example, karate, they, it's a very key principle that the elbow is drawn in and it doesn't matter which kind of punch they're doing. They'll try to draw that elbow in as much as possible. One, for the same reason, structural integrity and the pathway and focus of power through that pathway. And the second is to engage the correct muscles to develop power, to exert power while you're doing that uh, technique. Boxing has the same thing about their elbows and their, and, their, and their hands. They have a slightly different guard structure, but for the most part, it mirrors and echoes aspects of this. Again, we shouldn't get confused with application and uh, training, training skills and developing things. There's overlap, of course, but there's going to be certain aspects that you're going to conform to, as I said with the gym analogy, more in training and less in actual, in actual use. But the habits that you're going to develop are crucial. And uh, this is the basis of uh, this, this text, Zhou Bu Li Lei, Shou Bu Li Xin, Chu Dong Ru Dong Jin Sui Shen. And we see this repeated, not only in the founding text, but in subsequent texts over and over again, and extrapolated on with regards to what it means. These are also aspects that uh, current generations and older generations are pretty clear about what they mean. There is no big confusion about uh, what this text is talking about and the orientation of the elbows in relation to your, to your hands when you're moving. Let's take a look at a few examples of what prominent practitioners have written about this subject over the last hundred or so years. The esteemed Xing Yichuan practitioner Sun Lu Tang published his first book on Xing Yichuan in the year 1915 called Xing Yichuan Xue, or A Study of Xing Yichuan. In section 5, titled Essentials of Xing Yichuan Practice, amongst other key points that he explains, he states, irrespective of rising or falling, drilling or overturning, coming or going, it should always be that your elbows do not leave the ribs and the hands do not leave the heart. These are considered the essentials of Xing Yichuan. Knowing these are the key to Xing Yichuan. The esteemed Hebei Xing Yichuan practitioner Li Yi is said to have dictated a book which was published in approximately 1916. In section 4, the section on the eight words poems, he states, the three wrappings, embracings, the two brachia embrace the ribs, thereby, when extending and retracting, it will not be disorderly and chaotic. The well-known Hebei Xing Yichuan practitioner Li Jianqiu, in his book titled Xing Yichuan Shu, The Art of Xing Yichuan, published in 1919, stated in the sections regarding the five elements fists, section 2, Beng Quan, the elbows must finish being wrapped inward. This is the same as with Pi Quan, splitting fist with the hollow of the elbow facing upwards. In section 5 on Heng Quan, he states, When practicing, the elbow must be tightly wrapped inwards, and the rear fist is issued out from beneath the lead arm's elbow. Remember this. In chapter 6 of the same book, 
titled An Evaluation of Xingyi Chuan's Key Points, The Four Constant Essentials. Point 2 states, Wrap the elbows. Wrap the elbows and keep the arms bent. In this way, power from your shoulders will be transmitted to your hands. This is a crucial point from which all the methods within Xing Yi Chuan cannot deviate. If you do not wrap the elbows, the arms will be stiff, and in being stiff, power will not be issued out, but rather will remain in your arms. By testing these out one by one, you will better understand. Liu Dian Chen, who was the son of the esteemed Xing Yi Chuan practitioner Liu Qilan, states in his book published in 1921, titled Xing Yi Chuan Shu Jue Wei, or Selected Subtleties of the Art of Xing Yi Chuan. On the section regarding the four limbs, he states, Regarding the arm, the shoulder should forcefully be turned inwards. The elbow is rotated into the body's center line. The idea here is that the text is telling you an overarching instruction that for your movements in order for them to be you know so you don't telegraph so you don't telegraph a movement because there's an aspect with regards to your elbow coming out that you can telegraph the movement again we can go back to boxing and talk about this keeping everything in and keeping the hand behind the elbow is going to make it a lot more difficult for your opponent not only to see it but secondly because of the structure and the alignment, your movement is going to be a lot more flowing, a lot more direct, and a lot faster. So, as the initial text said, you can strike your opponent without him knowing and hit him when he's unsuspecting of it, as a result of keeping your elbows in and your hands on the center. Um, so, this is the overarching message with that line that they're trying to teach you. Again, as you get into the more advanced uh, practices, you'll see how in terms of Xing Yi Chuan's practices. The later content, you'll see how the elbow orientation will change when you're working on different planes of motion. But that concept of getting the elbow behind the joint is there, or the striking extremity, is there all the time. It's almost all the time that you want the, 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 the elbow and the extremity to follow and travel on the same path, depending on the plane of motion that you're using. So, the core of Xing Yi Chuan's practice, what we call the mother fists or the five elements and these habits that you develop there, and it's the most apparent with these elbows and the hands in the five elements, are what gonna, are, is what's going to teach you to do, and help you to develop the structure, motion and habits that will then be applied in numerous ways with the 12 animals and other aspects. The elbows being held in close to the flanks when they're extending and, and retracting, the hands being focused to travel in and out, targeting on your center. Um, apart from the structural integrity that it's helping you to develop and the efficacy of movement, it is of course related to a defensive uh, function as well. Keeping your elbows open exposes areas to be struck. Uh, the other side of things is if you recall from the uh, some of the partner applications, specifically within the Xing Yi Chuan uh, lessons that were released already. For example, the uh, Zhao Shou Pao partner training. Uh, when there's a strike coming in by the mere drawing in of the elbow, so that's the retracting part of that, being drawn in close to your ribs, it's blocking and deflecting what might be coming in to strike your, your body. And this applies even on this area here, if you draw your elbow in. So, the instruction of Chu Dong Ru Dong Jin Sui Shen, the body, uh, sorry, the hands uh, extending and retracting, the elbows extending and retracting tightly or closely following the body, um, deals with defense as well. But not only, we can see the overarching instruction is about motion. And that is the core concept here. Uh, we see it repeated over and over again in subsequent. Uh, uh, famed teachers' writings and, and explanations even down to modern times. And there's no confusion on what this means today and how the whole phrase works together. So this is something to keep in mind that you can apply when you're doing, um, when you're doing your five elements practice about where the elbow is in relation to the limb, how is it best oriented in line with following this principle of traveling as close to your, your body as possible and extending out on your center line. And you'll see how this unites not only the structure of your limb, but unites your limb to your mat.
We use our mass in Xing Yichuan, and you can understand that if you've got the, the root, as explained in the three sections uh, explanation, the root is urging behind the elbow, which is following behind the fist. You can understand if one of those things is out, being the center, which is very important. If the center is off of that alignment between the shoulder and the hand, any force that is, is coming in or out is going to dissipate out this way. And that is why we draw in the elbow. And the elbow follows the extremity and the root presses forward. When you apply this to your whole body, you can understand that pressing forward with your body, if your elbow is out, the force is going to dissipate out there. Your structure is going to be broken. So apply this to your five elements practice. See how you feel with the differences. Pay attention to the elbows and uh, you'll see a lot of uh, value in paying careful and close attention to this and not to develop bad habits.